the IBM Model M is, by many estimates, the greatest keyboard of all time. It debuted way back in 1985, almost four decades ago now, and over its lifespan, it sold over 10 million units and it's highly sought after by collectors and enthusiasts to this day thanks to its remarkable durability and unique sound and feel a result of its buckling spring switches. The Model M also happens to have been my first keyboard that I grew up with in the 1990s. And unfortunately, my parents got rid of our original Model M many years ago, not knowing that I would become a keyboard enthusiast in time, of course. And so ever since then, I've been on a, a quest to find myself an authentic, original IBM Model M. And it's not that easy, or I should say it is easy if you go searching on eBay, you can find them, but they can be quite costly, especially for, uh, you know, good quality examples that are in uh, pristine shape. They can be hundreds of dollars. Like I said, there's quite an enthusiast community that has grown up around this keyboard over the years. So if you really want to get an IBM Model M for a decent price, you have to find one locally, usually, or as part of a lot of electronics, often that's been sitting for a long period of time. And that's exactly what I did. I found this IBM Model M right here. It was being sold along with eight other vintage keyboards and a whole bunch of other electronic equipment, add-in cards, power supplies, all kinds of things dating from the 80s and 90s. I found it on Facebook Marketplace, $100 for the entire lot. And that seemed like a pretty darn good price to me. The keyboard alone was worth that. And when I went to pick up this lot, I found out that uh, this was what was left of hardware that belonged to a systems administrator for a local university. So there's actually a lot of cool stuff in there that I still have to dig through and identify. Lots of things I don't even know what they are. But certainly I knew what this was and this was the main draw for me. But like I said, unless you are willing to pay through the nose, you usually find these in kind of rough shape. And this Model M, along with all the other hardware there, had sat in storage for quite some time, many, many years. I don't know exactly how long, but it had all accumulated quite a bit of grime, dirt, dust, uh, cobwebs, all that sort of thing. And so recently, I set out to finally restore this Model M to clean it up, test it out, make sure it's functional and clean and as pristine as I could make it so that I could have it proudly sitting on my desktop. And in today's video, you're going to see that process where I uh, will give you a tour of the Model M to start with, share a little bit about the history of this keyboard and its significance in, in the history of computing. Then we disassemble it and I thoroughly clean every last bit of it, every speck of dirt off of there. And then I put it back together and we take it for a little test drive. So uh, I hope that you enjoy this. I hope you find it interesting. And of course, I hope you find it relaxing. A big, big thank you to this channel's supporters on Patreon and YouTube memberships because they are the ones that voted for this video topic this month. Our Foos Row and higher tier supporters get to vote every month on a video of their choice for that month. And this 
is our patrons pick slash members choice video for June 2023. If you, dear viewer or listener, would like to learn about some of the fun perks that you can unlock and how you can support this channel and the content I create through Patreon or YouTube memberships, there are of course links down below in the video description and it would mean a lot to me if you would check them out. I am so, so appreciative of this channel's supporters on Patreon and YouTube memberships. It makes a big, big difference and allows me to create content like this, which I love. <laughs> this is what I get really nerdy about and that hopefully you enjoy as well. So I am really, really looking forward to sharing this legendary keyboard with you all here today. Just as much as I am looking forward to sharing this video's legendary sponsor with you today, Into the AM. Into the AM are sellers of elevated everyday apparel. That means their clothes not only look amazing, but they feel incredible and they're super easy to take care of. I'm sporting some Into the AM right now, and I picked one that was thematic. Check it out. Now, technically, the PC or the computer on this t-shirt uh, is, I believe, a Mac. It looks like a Mac Classic, but it's got this beautiful vintage keyboard on here. How could I not love this t-shirt? I promise I will not be spilling paint all over my IBM Model M in today's video. But, of course, it's not just computers, not just keyboards they have on their t-shirts. They have all kinds of stuff, from spacey designs to natural designs to Asian-inspired designs. And I guarantee you that there will be one or more that you love. So I encourage you to head on down to the video description, click on through that link, and save yourself 10% of your entire order at Into the AM. It's important to note it's not just t-shirts either. They've got hoodies, they got tanks, they got shorts, they got underwear. All of it is exceptionally comfortable. I've said it many times, but I wear it pretty much every day. Not because they sponsor me, just because I really like their clothes. They're super comfortable, really easy to care for, and gorgeous as well. I even received a compliment on my t-shirt from a cashier today. Not this one, uh, the, the different one, but I bet you I would have received a compliment for this one as well. Many eye-catching designs. So, my friends, once again, you can save 10% on your entire order at Into the AM using the link down below at the top of the video description. And when you do, you will also be supporting me and this channel. So. I appreciate it very much if you do, and I appreciate Into the AM for sponsoring today's video. And with all that said, it's time to dive into the odyssey of restoring and cleaning this classic piece of hardware, this IBM Model M. Let's get to it. And here we have our Model M, and it's a beast. <laughs> it's huge. Uh, it's so much larger on my desk surface here than any of my other boards. These days, of course, we have all kinds of compact form factors, 75%, you know, 60%, even 40%, very tiny. This is not that. This is the full meal deal with our complete complement of almost, almost 108 standard keys. Uh, we're missing two, uh, which you can probably tell. The OS keys or the Windows keys typically would go right here. But aside from that, we actually do have a complete modern keyboard layout. We have our 
escape and F row keys up here or lock uh, print screen and pause keys our nav cluster and arrow keys over here our numpad on the far right up here our indicator lights and then our full bank of standard alphanumeric keys all in the standard ANSI size and layout. So as far as vintage keyboards go, this one's actually very um, familiar to a modern user. Vintage keyboard layouts can get really wacky and anything older than this, in fact, uh, often will be kind of weird by modern standards, but this one, very usable in a modern context. And it's not just the keys that add to the size. We've got these huge, huge bezels by, again, modern standards on the, the sides and bottom, and this massive forehead up here, uh, which bears the IBM badge. And this oval badge positioned over on the left here actually does help us date this keyboard to, I believe, 1986 or later. Uh, prior to that, it had a, a square badge over here on the right. Uh, but that said, you'll see in a moment when we turn it over that it actually has the date of production right on the back. So, so this is what we're going to be working with here. And you can see it's in actually very good shape. It is uh, pretty much flawless in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the finish. There are no uh, scratches or, or uh, scuffs visible, uh, at least not from this angle. But there is a bit of grime. It might be hard to tell from where you're at, but I will carefully lift this up because it is very heavy. <laughs> Uh, so that you can see some of the keycaps and the top plate there, top of the case, are kind of grimy. Um, and there's certainly, you know, no doubt going to be some dust and crud of various kinds in between the keys. There's quite a bit of dirt over here on the right-hand side. but. Considering its age, considering that it sat uh, for a great many years, it's remarkably clean. So that is going to make my job a lot easier. <laughs> uh, so let's do a really quick tour around here as if I were unboxing a modern keyboard for you. And uh, then we'll, we'll pop it open and, and get started with the actual cleaning and such. So, we talked about the layout. Uh, if we look around the front here, you'll we'll see we've got a case made of two pieces. Top piece, bottom piece, there's a seam along here. The front has this kind of rounded edge. The keycaps, as you can also see, are shiny on the sides, but matte on top, lightly textured on top shiny on the sides. If we come around the side here, I'm going to try and show you. This thing is so big though, I had a really hard time just fitting it like on the camera. Um, there, There's a bit of an angle to uh, the case, so it's kind of wedge shaped. Again, I don't know if I can even really show you, but maybe you can kind of see there. It's a bit wedge shaped, so it has a natural angle to it, a couple of degrees, not very much. Something interesting, if we look at the keycaps from the side, is you'll see that they're actually all the same height, which is uh, not the case for modern keycaps with modern OEM or other uh, sculpted keycaps. You have different uh, heights on different rows, here, what actually happens is all the keycaps are of the same height, but the board itself 
is curved like this. And that is how they have each row sort of uh, sculpted to your fingers ergonomically. But uh, the caps themselves, I believe, are the same height across all those rows. You can actually see that curvature really easily here where, where uh, it, it kind of emerges up and out of the plane of the board. And you will see that curvature again when we get this open and you see the actual plate underneath, uh, which is itself curved. So if we come around the back edge here, we once again have a curved surface. And we have a connector over here. This is uh, maybe not one you recognize. This is a uh, uh, what they call an SDL connector, and it's it's a jack style connector, kind of like a like an RJ45, like a phone jack or, or an Ethernet cable, really. That's what you might be more familiar with, like a Cat5. Um, and so uh, that cable is obviously removable, which is really nice, and actually in this case really important. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but uh, for now, I've detached that cable and uh, that makes it easier to work with. You can also see there that we have a little bolt. Uh, the top is a little hex nut and um, there's four of those here. One, two, three, and four over there. This one is very easily accessed. The others are sunk in these wells, and uh, that is actually the trickiest part about getting into this board. Uh, those uh, uh, bolts require a, a nut driver, uh, a uh, 732 nut driver, or or five and a half millimeter in metric, and it's got to be narrow enough to fit down these wells. And uh, I thought I was gonna have to order one online uh, because my uh, electronics repair kit only has um, uh, up to a five millimeter uh, nut driver. So, uh, but fortunately my father-in-law uh, actually had a 732 uh, and it's just, just slim enough to uh, fit down those wells. So I did test it out before we began recording here so that it ought to be able to uh, get those those little bolts out of there. Uh, but that's really the trickiest part about getting into this thing because aside from that, well, there's nothing. <laughs> there's, no, there's no other... Uh, uh, screws or bolts or anything not under these little rubberized feet here uh, So it's just those four and then the top case and the bottom case should come apart quite nicely uh, In addition to these little rubberized feet down here We've got these little guys here, which actually aren't even rubberized. They're just kind of hard plastic This right here is what I'm talking about, but that would be the little foot keyboard sits on, unless, of course, you want to have these these feet. Oh, that one's stiff. Let's see if this other one is a little more compliant. Yes, there we go. If you want to have them flipped out, you can do that. You can hear as I'm letting the keyboard rest on its uh, face, the weight of the keyboard is actually pushing down <laughs> on a bunch of the switches. Um, so, let's, uh, no, this does not want to, there we go, come down. Uh, a few other interesting things here, you can also see that we have a, uh, a spot for a integrated speaker. I don't think there actually is one in here, but there is a grill for it, and perhaps some models did include one, not this one, however. And then 
uh, finally, I'm going to turn this around carefully. We have our badge, our manufacturing badge. And this one, this is a very interesting one. So we've got the IBM logo, some certifications, uh, IBM Corp 1994 copyright. But uh, we can see that this particular board was actually produced in Mexico, manufactured in Mexico by IBM in Mexico. Uh, so this comes to us from Mexico. Uh, and uh, we've got a part number here. Uh, 1391401, uh, which is a, a designator for this particular revision of the Model M. It also tells us manufacture the 22nd of November 1990. So this is, I guess, a later version of this model. I think they revised it again in the early 90s, maybe around 92 or so. Um, but I guess that puts pretty firmly in the middle of the production run of this style of Model M. So it didn't quite make the 80s. We're into the, the 90s with this board. My childhood. <laughs> uh, and Planta IEP, I guess, is telling us maybe which manufacturing plant it was made in. And it tells us Modelo M. Modelo M. We also have a random fluorescent sticker here that says 28 on it. That would not have been from the factory. Uh, and I'll probably remove that when I clean this thing. So that is the, the tour. And you've, you've heard the keyboard a little bit. <laughs> it's just been down on its face there. But uh, you can probably hear it's got a very distinctive sound to it. That's because this keyboard uses a, a switch mechanism that's very different than the mechanical switches of today. Now, uh, at the time that this was produced, a Cherry MX mechanical switches were in use. Some keyboards did use them. The Model M's, however, use a system called buckling springs, which is exactly what it sounds like. You'll see when we get this open, but underneath each keycap is a spring. <laughs> and uh, that spring, when you push down on the keycap, it buckles. It goes from like this to like, like this. And um, that's what gives these keys their distinctive tactile feel and sound. So just to listen, let's push down. And that snap you hear is the spring buckling and impacting against the side of uh, the, uh, it's, it's not a stem, it's a column, I guess, a, a well, I don't know what you call it, but you'll see, you'll see when we get it open. Um, and there's a lot of ping to it uh, these days, you know, spring ping, that That resonance that you hear after each keystroke is generally considered a, a negative thing. You don't want spring ping in your switches, but on these old buckling spring keyboards, it's all about that spring ping. Uh, and uh, like modern keyboards, we also have some stabilized keys here. The longer ones are backspace, enter, shift, and of course the space bar. Again, by modern standards, that sounds pretty rough. There's no lube on these stabilizers. They're just bare wires and rattly as all get out. But it's part of the charm of these old bar, uh, boards. It's, it's kind of part of the appeal. Um, they are sonically very chunky. Everything about them just goes ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And, uh, you can imagine how this can get pretty loud pretty fast. These are not quiet keyboards by any stretch. 
Uh, so that's really all there is to see here, uh, on the outside, at least. But now it's time for us to begin our adventure inside this keyboard. And that will allow us to pull it apart, give it a proper cleaning inside and out. So let's flip it over here again. Oh, there's one more detail that's worth mentioning. You might have noticed that uh, there are little stickers here on the shift, control, and alt keys, uh, color-coded. I believe that was uh, just to help with uh, keyboard shortcuts and key maps. They can use those colors to indicate uh, key combinations, and oh, this would help uh, users of these keyboards at the time. Now, um, I think these are stock because I've seen them on pictures of, of other similar Model M's of this vintage. I don't know that I really like them much, <laughs> aesthetically. I think they look a little tacky. Uh, but we'll see what happens because I'm going to be, of course, uh, just bring this around here, uh, washing washing those keycaps, and I don't know that those stickers are going to survive uh, the soaking washing process. Uh, on one hand, I really do want to keep it fully stock, uh, so I'm reticent to remove those things, but uh, if they don't survive the soaking process, I won't be heartbroken. So here's our, our nudge driver and our 732 uh, socket there. X socket. And this could get a little tricky. I do have to apply a fair amount of force, especially on the uh, the deep wells here, in order to uh, get that uh, socket to, to bite, so to speak, around the, uh, the, the bolts there. But let's, let's start with this one, because it should be a little easier. And uh, this is the one I tested on. I tested on two, really. This one, and then one of the ones in the well, just to make sure that this could, in fact, make it down the well. So, there is our first one. As you can see, it's just a little, tiny little bolt with a little hex top, like that really too bad IBM didn't just put a little slot in there so that you could you could uh, pop this open with the flathead uh, but not how they did it um, so let's let's try this one down here some of these could get a little tricky as I said I have to put a fair bit of pressure on here I think I think that might have done it let's see out. No, not at all. <laughs> that was being real stubborn. Okay, well, we'll come back to that one. Uh, I did test with this one, and I know that it will. You can actually see the, uh, the plastic is uh, actually kind of rubbing off on my bit here. Um, because... Uh, it's rubbing right up against the sides of that well. Um, but uh, it should should be doable. It should be doable. Yeah, this one definitely. I, I did test on this one earlier and it, it comes right out like so. Uh, I'll just leave that there and then once I've got all three loosened off, I'll uh, flip it over and they'll just come falling out. Uh, let's try this corner and just see. I'm not sure if I have it or not. Mm, no. <laughs> okay, so these corner ones seem a little trickier. Might have to just, uh, yeah, this is, this is tricky. Might have to just, uh, reposition this and see what I can do. Okay, uh, I got him. <laughs> I just had to 
bring it over into my, my lap where I could uh, really uh, kind of bear down on it with the, uh, with the nut driver here. Get lots of pressure on it to just uh, drive it into the bottom of that well and have it bite onto uh, or, you know, fit around that uh, the head of each one of these. So in theory, I should just be able to go like this. There, I think I heard three. Yes. Uh, got one, two, and three. And I don't know if there's any special order or, you know, I think these are all just the same. They're all generic. Uh, but you know what? I will keep them in the order uh, for their uh, appropriate sockets there, just in case, just in case. Let's do that, that, and that. I just got them off to the side. Really, I should probably have them in a little dish, uh, just in case, but I do not. So you can, you can hear there. Uh, the top uh, of the case is very much ready to just come right off. So I believe, yeah, there we go. Just lifts off like that. And there we have it. Very easy, actually very simple. Uh, and very clean. Like, wow, we've got a little bit, a little bit of dirt here, you know, some dust and crap, but honestly, this thing's in remarkable shape. Uh, it looks like there's these little, just little uh, tabs along the front here that kind of just slot in along this front edge. Um, but really no other mechanisms holding it in place. You can see, of course, that the uh, little uh, indicator lights here are translucent. We've got the LEDs down here on a little daughter board. It sits off to the side. And that's pretty much it. Simple. Hefty piece of plastic though, relatively thick. So that I will be cleaning uh, off camera probably, because uh, the easiest way to clean this is probably just in a sink, some running water, a little bit of dish detergent, and a gentle brush. So I will put that aside for now. So we are left with the uh, base of our board here. Now, I think that this, this you see this uh, uh, metal plate that sits underneath, and then this plastic plate here, and all the keycaps and whatnot, I think this actually just lifts right off as well. Although there are clearly uh, a few ribbon cables attaching to things underneath. So we do have to be careful about that. This little four pin cable looks like uh, is what feeds our, our little uh, LED daughter board here. Um, we will leave that for the moment because we'll actually take the keycaps off first. Um, and we do have a little bit of, you know, dirt under here. Obviously it's somewhat grimy, but really not bad considering the age of this thing. Um, so the keycaps, so the keycaps here are maybe not what you expect. Uh, if, if these are in fact, um, like the ones I've seen online. So let's find out. Let's pull off the keycap. <laughs> there you go. So you see, I, I took off the keycap, but there's still a cap underneath it. These keycaps really are caps. They just sit on top of these blank caps, which actually are kind of like the switch. Uh, they sit on top of the column that houses the uh, buckling spring. And uh, that makes these very easy to take off and clean, which is nice. The uh, sort of under caps, if you want to call them, uh, are, should actually be pretty clean because they will have been underneath 
these top caps for their entire existence, probably. Um, I may take them off anyway, uh, because it'll probably make it easier to clean the, the plastic plate underneath. Um, but uh, for now, let's take off these top caps. This is also a good opportunity uh, for me to uh, talk a little bit about the legends on here. Just like modern keycaps are often, uh, you know, marked by die sublimation. That's the same with these keycaps. So the die is fused into the keycap plastic. Uh, I don't actually know what type of plastic these are, um, but uh, whatever type they are, they seem pretty durable. And, um, and so those legends will never wear out used into the plastic. But of course, you can never use these on a modern mechanical keyboard with Cherry MX style switches because these undercaps, I can pull it off here, uh, do not have Cherry MX style uh, stems or are not designed to accommodate Cherry MX style stems. Instead, they have these, this kind of round uh, structure and then this uh, slot, and that slot is where the spring sits. Um, I guess since we're here, since we're doing this, might as well just uh, show you the spring mechanism. But uh, the spring itself, hopefully you can see that, just exists. This little, little column here. Uh, which is part of this molded plastic plate and uh, it's actually attached to the uh, actuation mechanism underneath it will not fall out it's it's attached um, it just kind of flops around like that when you take off the the uh, undercap but that that spring the buckling action of that spring can't really do it here but that's what is uh, creating the tactile sound and feel of the board and leading to the actuation. So this plastic unit with these little columns uh, is all kind of one piece uh, and it is attached to this metal plate, this steel plate underneath. And I will not be taking that apart because I think that, that wrecks the keyboard. It's not really designed to come apart. So. Uh, but what we will do is take off all these caps and clean the top surface and then take this plate out, flip it over and clean underneath as well. So let's uh, take off these caps. Now, um, I guess these, these under caps I do have to be careful with because if I soak them in water, they're going to get wet, uh, you know, water in there. And I don't want water in there when I put them back on keyboard because um, uh, evidently if you get stuff down these columns, water or dust or debris or otherwise, it can interfere with the actuation of that key and we don't want that. So what I might do is take off these undercaps but not wash them, just keep them separate because again they should be pretty much perfectly clean. But these uh, top caps I will definitely be cleaning and they are going to go right here to some soapy water, some warm soapy water, just like, lost to float, just like that. <laughs> and, uh, and that should um, uh, get all the dirt and grime off if I leave it to soak for a while, stir them gently every once in a while. I'll probably leave them in there for like, hours, honestly. So uh, this is going to be sort of a two-parter. I mean, for you, it'll happen all in one video, but I'll take the caps off here and then I will uh, plop them in there, let them soak for a while, and then we'll have to come back to this uh, in a little bit. But for now, uh, let's just take these caps off. Now I did, I did bring a little keycap puller. Uh, but, you know, 
I don't think that's really going to help much. I mean, it, it does work for, for pulling off these undercaps, but it's easy enough to do it with your, your bare hands as well. Like so, right? And, uh, you can see the little, the way these are designed to fit together. They have these little tabs. That just kind of helps lock it in place there. But they come off nice and easily. It's a good design, really. I'll put that in there. Of course, we don't have to worry about shine through caps or anything like that because there's no RGB on this board, only the three LEDs over here. Uh, let's maybe move things over here a little bit just so that you guys can appreciate the sudsy water. <laughs> it's just kind of kind of nice to plop the keycaps in there. Bring that there. So of course there are other ways that you could clean these things. You could use a, you know, a disinfecting wipe or something or, you know, um, some other scrubby item or whatever, but evidently this works just great. Uh, plopping them into, into some water and just letting them soak for a while. And, uh, yeah, I've just got some, some Dawn dish soap in here. That should do the trick. They might take the nice sounds actually, don't they? Quite nice. <laughs> they keep wanting to float like little, little boats just on the surface there. Um, I know you can't see the far right side there, but just have to just have to live with it. Now you might be wondering what's the situation with the bigger stabilized keys? Do they have the same cap system? And the answer is no, they don't. They uh, just come off as one piece. But, uh, that's okay. Now we do have to be a little careful with the stabilized keys because of those stabilizers don't want to have them get caught and uh, accidentally break something. I'm not 100% sure what that mechanism looks like. They're not your standard modern Cherry MX style plate mount or uh, PCB mount stabs. They're a little different, I believe. in the color of these undercaps, right? Like this one's lighter, this one's darker, this one's lighter, some medium tones and then darker. Wonder why that is. So this might be where it makes sense to actually start using a keycap puller. It's gonna be a little tricky to pop off these ones just with right there. Well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe I spoke too soon. They do come off pretty easy. As we said earlier, it's a standard QWERTY layout. Uh, I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if this 
specific model. The Model M is what led to this standardized 108 key layout that we are all familiar with today. I mean, I'm sure there were kind of multiple keyboards converging on that layout, but uh, this is such a, a legendary keyboard, uh, you know, it's such an important um, place in the history of keyboards that, and computing in general, that it wouldn't surprise me at all if, uh, if this was the sort of progenitor of this layout. swirling these around here, so I've got a wet hand here. Let me just grab some paper towel and uh, dry my hand off. In addition to the soapy water and the paper towel, uh, I also have some isopropyl alcohol. This is 99%. I've heard that 70% uh, actually does a better job of cleaning, but this is what we had in the cupboard. So, and um, and then I've got uh, some just uh, you know cotton swabs, Q-tips uh, to get into those sort of hard to reach places, uh, cracks and crevices as needed. So. I uh, could use any number of other cleaning tools, of course. Uh, might make sense to have a little a brush uh, to get off sort of the, the worst of this. And in fact, I probably will do that. Um, and uh, you could, as I said earlier, use disinfecting wipes. I've seen people use Windex as a cleaning agent rather than alcohol. Or just plain soapy water. As long as you're careful not to get it onto the PCB, you should be okay. And even if you did, you know, if you just let it uh, dry off, it's probably fine. But um, the other tool that people often use is uh, a toothbrush. It's a soft toothbrush. Again, as a way of uh, getting into Getting tricky over here. <laughs> getting into uh, the cracks and crannies. Come on. Hmm. Okay, I'll we'll leave that for now. <laughs> Does this caps lock come off easily enough? Because it's not a stabilized key. I don't think so. Really. Oh, but look at that. It does actually come off all in one piece. It doesn't have that undercap situation. So that's just all in one. And I guess those ones I will have to be extra careful with to make sure they're very dry uh, on the underside before I put them back on. While we're over here, let's take off the control. It does have a little undercap. There's that little sticker, little decal or decal, if you will. It's a bit yellowed with age. That's another thing, actually, I didn't talk about, but um, this keyboard, it's a little bit yellowed, but really not too bad. Um, and it's yellowed very evenly, so it looks quite good. Um, there is a way to remove yellowing from vintage plastics in electronic components like this. Uh, it's commonly called retro brighting, retro bright, and uh, it uses peroxide to uh, 
essentially bleach out the plastics, is my understanding. Uh, there are other techniques as well, um, but that's the one that I am familiar with. And uh, it's a bit of work, uh, is my understanding. I've never actually done it. Uh, I considered it with this keyboard, but I really don't see the need uh, because it's it's in such good shape. So I think I'm just gonna leave the case. You know, I'm gonna clean it, but I won't bother with the retro braid. I'm gonna start uh, doing this here in order to more easily access some of these caps, which are being a little, a little stubborn. So, so 
I am going to, you know, I might just leave the space bar as is. I don't want to risk trying to pull uh, the uh, wire out of here um, for fear of uh, snapping those little clips. Uh, but I can just uh, clean this by hand on its own. That's easy enough. And then they, they clip in. Here, let me just move this here. Uh, the, the wire on the top side of the space bar clips in to little clips right on the plastic plate that you can probably see there. There. And there. So that's quite primitive, but, you know, it seems to do the job, although it doesn't sound, you know, super nice doing it, but, uh, you know, it, it's functional. So, here is our keycap soup. So many ASMR channels these days are doing the the wooden soup trigger. It does sound nice, so I understand why. But here on the ASMR Nerd channel, we have keycap soup. Not just any keycaps, vintage IBM Model M keycaps. sound. <laughs> I kind of want to keep doing that, but we should probably move on with cleaning this thing. So I dropped my uh, paper towel. <laughs> so I will grab another piece here. So the next step is, of course, to remove all of these under caps. I don't think that's the official terminology. It's just the terminology I'm using. I don't know that they have an official name, uh, but I will uh, set those off to the side here, uh, just over here for now, uh, because I'm not going to wash those. In theory, as I said, they should be pretty clean, but uh, let's, let's just uh, pop these all off. And in theory, it should not matter where they go when I put them back on. Because every one of them should be the same, except some are clearly different colors. But I don't think they're functionally different. I think they're all identical. And this is where that uh, situation with the, the uniform profile of the keycaps comes into play. Remember, I was mentioning earlier that uh, these keycaps all are the same height, have the same profile. That's why I can get away with doing this, uh, because in theory, all of these, regardless of where they come from on the board, should be identical in shape, at least, if not color. I suppose if something you know, if it really does require me, for some reason, to put the exact same ones back where they came from, I'd have to rewatch this video <laughs> to try to match them up. There's no way that's the case, and there's no way I could do that, but... These make some nice sounds, too.
I'm willing to bet that if you one one were to look online, you could probably find modern reproductions of these under caps and probably all this stuff. As a matter of fact, there's a substantial enthusiast scene around these Model M's. The Model M design and tooling was actually, uh, I believe, purchased from IBM or in some way transferred from IBM to a, a modern company. Not that IBM is not modern, it does still exist, but um, a, uh, a smaller company uh, called Unicomp. Um, because IBM stopped manufacturing the Model M's sometime in the 90s, I want to say. I think Lexmark might have then made them for a little while. Maybe Lenovo was in there somewhere too. But eventually, uh, the uh, manufacturer of these things transitioned to Unic Unicomp. And I think they are the only ones still making modern Model M's. Uh, now they, they have changed over the years. Uh, you will not find them looking or uh, constructed exactly like these old ones. My understanding is the materials used in the modern reproductions are a fair bit cheaper. The plastics are thinner. The uh, fitment and um, tooling has degraded over time. Um, and so, if you, you really want the authentic experience, you've got to go with the, the genuine vintage article. But I would be curious to try a modern Unicomp Model M Repro and compare it to the authentic article, just in terms of design and feel and sound, and, you know, quality of materials and whatnot. Maybe I'll see if I can get my hands on one. Maybe, possibly, Unicomp might be interested in sending one over for me to review or unbox. I should reach out to them and see after I've been sitting here trash talking their, their modern build quality and again I've never used them I don't know if that's the case for sure that's just some uh, some of what I've read online but uh, perhaps I would be pleasantly surprised I don't know I heard 
something snapped there, but no, we're okay. That's the challenge with all, all these, uh, you know, vintage uh, electronics is that over time, plastic inevitably does start to degrade, become more brittle. So you do have to be careful, especially with fine components like those little clips here for the spacebar stabilizer. So there's the naked board, scandalous. This is as disassembled as this piece is going to get, but I do believe, as I said, we can lift this whole plate off of here and gain access to uh, the case underneath uh, and the, the PCB for the keyboard, which sits underneath uh, and is connected by this ribbon cable. Now the question is, can this be detached here? I have to be pretty careful here. This is actually, oh, fascinating. It's just mounted to a, just a piece of plastic. Look at that. It's just a thin piece of film there. And this little PCB, this little daughter board is just, looks like glued to that surface perhaps. Um, so I'm not sure if this little connector comes off of here. Let me just take a closer look here. Yeah, I reckon it does. I reckon it does. And then underneath here, there's going to be some kind of situation as well. But let, let me just see if this, if this, hmm. I'm, I'm very hesitant to, this off of here. Maybe I'll just leave that for now. Let's just see if I can lift this out and flip it over. So you can see uh, on the forward edge, it just kind of slots in. There's these little, little clips along the front edge and the whole plate just slots into there. This whole thing actually just kind of lifts out there. All right, well, hopefully, hopefully that goes back in easily enough. But this uh, does give me the opportunity to show you guys the PCB and the back side of the plate as well. This is all kind of delicate. Again, these little plugs here, I might be able to remove them, but I kind of don't want to. I think I might just keep this thing as one unit as it is um, and try and just lay it back in place once I've cleaned the bottom case. But let's pick this up and flip it around. Oh, there's something interesting here. Uh, once again, we see some information about the manufacturer it says here. 22nd of November, 1990, shop date, a part number, which will be that product identifier, then an EC number, I don't know what that is, and then model, someone has handwritten M right there, model M, the rest of this does not seem to be filled out, uh, you can see the plate is steel. It's got this kind of lovely look to it. And um, a lot of these uh, uh, little uh, plastic bits, or all of them, I guess, are, uh, you know, carry through to the front and are how 
the uh, plastic plate is attached to the metal plate. Fascinating. This is the PCB uh, from the back here. You can see all the solder points. There's some identifying information along the, the edge there. It's really clean though. There's that STL connector, of course. And uh, it's kind of what we got. It's, it's hard for me to show you the other side of this PCB and I, I'm holding this very gingerly because I really don't want to accidentally wreck some fine piece here, but maybe I can give you just a, just a, a little peek there. Let me just reposition here. So, there we are. It's tough too with the microphones. I don't want to hit them, but you can see all those surface mount components, variety of capacitors, resistors, logic chip, this one here, that one there. I can't read what's on them, but maybe you can. Like I said, bumping the camera. Maybe you can. Um, but I think I'm going to leave that like so. And like I said, this whole unit kind of stays like this. It does not really come apart any further. So, uh, I'm going to be cleaning this up, of course. This is really the muckiest part, actually. Um, but let's just very gently set that off to the side for the moment. And take a quick look at the bottom case. Not much to see here. Just that uh, speaker grill, which again, no speaker built in here, but looks like there could be on some models. And uh, nothing much other than that. This will be very easy to clean. Just a couple of little bits of stuff. It looks like uh, a few pieces of plastic in here where some of those little little bits have broken off that we saw on the back of the uh, plate there. Uh, they've just sheared off over time and that's probably something that happens as they get more brittle. Now I've heard that uh, there there is a something called a bolt mod which I guess uh, you can use to to uh, use metal bolts to secure the plate to, to the plastic um, piece there uh, if too many of these have, have come off on your Model M. I don't believe that's the case here. It looks pretty well secured on there. So even though we've lost a few, I'm not too concerned. So uh, I am going to set this aside as well. Let's bring our plate and uh, PCB and all that back in here. And uh, this is going to be uh, my task. Now, this video is going to be pretty long if I clean this whole thing here. And really, I should probably actually take a brush to this, maybe some canned air, um, and see about getting off the worst of this crime before I take, um, you know, uh, a cloth or a, in this case, a paper towel to it, but just for, just for the sake of demonstration, let's just, uh, do a little bit here just to see how this dirt comes off. I want to be careful with that PCB underneath there, of course. I 
that way. Yeah, most definitely. Also making a mess of my desk surface here. <laughs> Despite the cleanliness of the board overall, there is still a fair bit of grime. <laughs> Lots coming off. And this is going to take a bit of work. And I think I'll probably do that off camera. I hope that doesn't disappoint any of you, but it's the kind of thing where it's probably easier for me to, to do it, where I can get sort of better angle on things. And also, um, you know, really take the time to get into the nooks and crannies. So, um, maybe do it somewhere that I'm not gonna make a mess of my desk surface. But it's gonna be basically this. <laughs> Probably also with, uh, with the uh, cotton swabs. Because when it comes to getting in between, that's gonna be a real trick. There's no easy way to do this. Uh, by the looks of it, it's just going to be time, patience, and uh, and some very fine cleaning. I think I'm going to end up going through a lot of these cotton swaps. I might try the toothbrush method as well, but as I as I was saying. You have to be very careful to not get debris down these little shafts um, because that can impact the functioning of the board. Ugh, that's gross. Look at that. Disgusting. So, my friends, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go clean this up clean the top and bottom cases and uh, let those keycaps over here soak for quite a while and uh, get all that grime, that muck off of them. And then we will get back together here and put this whole thing back together reassemble and hopefully once it's all back together it'll work and uh look great doing it so i'm gonna go do that uh for you it'll just be a second though and here we are with the power of editing <laughs> the cleaning is done uh so it, it is a good thing that I, uh, you know, took this and, and cleaned it elsewhere because what I ended up doing is uh, basically scrubbing each half of the case in the sink. And uh, that allowed me to give it a really good deep clean. I used uh, an old uh, soft bristle toothbrush and uh, gentle soap, just dish, dish soap and warm water, and I kind of scrubbed it and cleaned it, and it came out pristine, like perfect, <laughs> like pretty much as flawless as the day it was made. Um, there's really no visible discoloration. All that uh, mucky dirt that was on this end has been washed away. Uh, same thing on this side here. Um, of course the inside was already quite clean, but now it is spotless. Uh, it really, really did come out remarkably clean. And, uh, the lower half of the case is actually pretty much the same scenario. Uh, this was a little bit trickier simply because of the uh, sticker on the back here and uh, so I did uh, use some plastic and tape attempt to 
seal the sticker in here, essentially. Unfortunately, uh, a little bit of water somehow made its way in here still. And uh, so you can actually maybe notice just a touch of discoloration around the edges of the sticker now. It's very subtle, and some was already there, uh, to be fair, but uh, that's where a little bit of water leaked in and uh, just got under the edges of the sticker. But you know, it's barely noticeable. Uh, none of what matters was damaged, like all the information is still intact. Um, aside from that, you know, everything cleaned up just great. Again, practically brand new. Um, and a little speck here, but that's just lint, actually. Uh, truly, uh, I'm, I'm really amazed with how pristine this is. Uh, it was in great shape to begin with. You know, I did have to do a little bit of scrubbing and cleaning, but it, it was in remarkable shape to begin with. So, uh, that's the situation with the case. It's basically flawless, and that is awesome. Uh, then we have, of course, the plate. The plate. Um, this was the muckiest part by far. And this was also the most challenging piece to clean up, but uh, I think I managed to get it pretty much as clean as one could reasonably hope for. Uh, you know, considering uh, that it did start off pretty mucky. And it is a challenging thing to clean, getting in between all of these uh, little columns here, these little shafts. Uh, was actually a fair bit of work, and uh, I found I had the most success with a um, so with I, I use isopropyl alcohol exclusively on here just in case uh, any of it sort of uh, leaked through uh, or got on the PCB. Um, I didn't want to use soap and water, so this was all done with alcohol and. Um, looking at some of these. It's going to be a challenge on some of these to, to get the, uh, you know, caps back on properly, but um, isopropyl alcohol, and then I used the toothbrush on the big open parts, but the head was not narrow enough to get in uh, between all of these, so I used a couple of um, kind of uh, old paint brushes, uh, just medium-sized paint brushes, I used one that I sort of dipped in the alcohol and then kind of, you know, squished it around in between these things, sort of along the rows and along the angles. And then another one, which was mostly dry, to kind of brush out, oops, brush out any of the gunk and dirt that kind of got lifted off by uh, the alcohol soaked first brush. And I had to do that a few times, and there were a couple of stubborn spots that required the use of cotton swabs to really get in there. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with how it cleaned up. You know, there's no functional advantage, really, even to cleaning this. Like, this surface doesn't do anything um, functionally. But aesthetically, it's nice to have a clean keyboard. And this sure does look pretty clean. Again, I think it's about as clean as one could reasonably hope for, especially given its age and the fact that it sat for so long. So, really happy with how this came out. Uh, as far as the back goes, I... Let's flip this around. Barely touched it. <laughs> uh, I did not use any uh, uh, cleaning agents on the back here. I just used um, a clean brush and just uh, kind of gently brushed and cleaned it. And that's all I needed because it's pretty much immaculate. Um, and similarly, I didn't really touch the PCB. It didn't need it. It is incredibly clean. Like, again, pretty much pristine given its age. And, uh, 
And that is kind of that. Um, so really happy with how it all came out. The only thing over here that I used a bit of alcohol on was just uh, the SDL connector. Make sure the contacts in there are clean and all that. But everything else, yeah, I just kind of left it. So, um, and then there's the keycaps, of course, which I'll show you in a moment. But I think uh, what I'm going to do first is actually reassemble this. So, uh, let's just slot this back in here. You know what the answer here is? Let's turn this around. Uh, let's just do this so that I can see what's going on with the PCB here. And, uh, this can just slot in up there, like so, and then back here, how is this situated? So, uh, I think this just sits in here like so, I don't think there was anything actually keeping the PCB attached to anything, really. <laughs> um, the only thing is that there's two little posts that uh, hold this connector in place. So let's just gently bring this down into place. Okay, it's on the little posts. I can feel it, and I guess that is what positions the PCB in place, more or less. And then uh, this comes over, like so. And these. One and two are what seat the rest of it. These little ribbon cables seem pretty happy there. This one seems pretty happy here. I didn't really touch this at all over here. And that's pretty much that. I think everything is in place now. Does it feel secure? Fairly. It's a little bit of wiggle, but that's must be by design, right? It's just how it is. So, that uh, was really easy. <laughs> I was afraid that it might be a, a little trickier to get in place, but uh, seems good. So, with that done, uh, the top can go back on. And now I'm, I'm gonna, I think, put the top case back on before I put the keycaps and whatnot on, just because I think it'll be easy enough to put the keycaps on with this in place. Uh, a little harder to take them off, but uh, it should be simple to put them on once this top case is on. So there's that. And of course we have our screws here, which I had originally kept in their original order. No longer. <laughs> it really doesn't matter though. Not in the slightest. They're all identical. Um, and uh, of course we will have to use our uh, nut driver there to screw these back in on this side. So let's just bring this around like so. with all the springs on the underside, of course. All right. Okay, so let's just pop this down in there. It should be simple enough to just kind of guide that in. Do this. I know you can't see much except the back of my arm. this 
face down like that, but it should be okay. Should be okay. Now it's just actually grabbing hold. No, it's not. The screw's not actually sitting in its uh, hole. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? That's why not. Because it's at an awkward angle. Let's just try that again. Very carefully drop it down there. There, I think that's better. Yes, that's definitely in place. Okay, just do that. won't be screwed in quite as tight as they were to start with, but that's probably not a bad thing. It makes it a lot easier for me to get back in if I need to in future. To, you know, I'll clean it again, I guess, if I wanted to. Come on. <laughs> Just shake it until it drops in. No. Okay. It's gonna make me dump it out. Oh, really? Why is it so finicky? It just doesn't want to go down the hole. One more time. Curses. <laughs> I don't know. Let's try this one. This one's easy. That one's straightforward. Alright, that's in place. Just this last one here, it's being a little bit stubborn. Just a wee bit. Keep doing that and then almost dropping it. <laughs> Got the floor. If I could, uh, if it would stay in there, I would do that, but it's, it's not magnetized, so I'm just gonna have to Why did the other ones go in just fine? This one's being really stupid. There. Got it. Pretty sure. There it is. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Excellent. So, the board is back together. Now, there's, oh, there's like a little, oh, I wonder if that's supposed to crunch together like that. Well, it's crunched together now. <laughs> I guess maybe that's intentional, I don't know. Maybe there's something that snaps in there together. Trying to sort of evaluate the solidity of this. Everything is. Yeah, I think that's about right. There's a little bit of creaking going on, but you know, what can you do, right? Um, that's just how it's made, that's the way it's designed. But it all feels pretty firm there. And uh, our connector is exposed as it needs to be. Uh, there so okay so now comes 
the undercaps, as we've been calling them. So let's see what we can do in that regard. Now this might be a bit tricky because uh, we need to make sure that each cap, I just put all the undercaps in, in a plastic bag there. Um, each cap needs to, uh, and I have to figure out which direction these sit. Should be easy enough, but okay, like so. Uh, I need to make sure that each cap grabs its uh, spring, you know, because um, that spring has to sit right in there, of course. And so, or like so. There. As long as it makes the buckling spring sound, then it should be good. So let's, uh, let's just... do that, and we'll just go through all of these caps that way until we've finished the board. And then, of course, we'll have the actual keycaps, which, so these ones, as you saw, I soaked them, and, uh, you know, in a bit of warm water and soap, let them sit for quite a while, swirled them occasionally, and then I transferred them into a colander rinse them thoroughly, then put them back into some more warm soapy water, and then took that little toothbrush, and I pulled each one out, gave each one a gentle scrub with the toothbrush and the soapy water, then rinsed it and set it aside to dry, and let them air dry. So each one has been hand washed, and uh, ought to be very clean. Uh, they all look extremely clean. Uh, you know, aside from a couple of tiny little scratches and scuffs, uh, they're virtually pristine. So, uh, like the rest of the board, they uh, should look fantastic once, once we get them on here. So I think for the rest of this segment, probably won't talk much because uh, there's not a lot to say. You guys can just sort of enjoy the, the uh, sounds and the vibes. I put these all back on. I mean, I might pipe up occasionally to say something, but ASMR is nice every once in a while.
these uh, undercaps do have like a little bit of some kind of residue on them. Slightly grimy, but most of them are pretty clean. Uh, I didn't clean them. Maybe I should have, but oops. Of course, they'll be under the top caps, the upper caps. Literally, uh, you won't touch them, see them, nothing, right? So they're pretty darn good. It's just a couple that have a little bit of grime, but it's not bad at all. I thought putting these back on would be a little bit more challenging to like get the the spring position properly, but it seems like it's not an issue at all. Just grabs no problem. Very well designed, honestly. Of course I say this now, maybe maybe when we actually test the keyboard find that some of them do not work, but I hope that's not the case, <laughs> because it was all working uh, before I pulled it apart, so uh, let's hope. Let's hope it all works when I put it back together.
pictures of me that uh, I actually put. <laughs> I put. You probably been watching this whole time. I'm like, why don't we have enough of these? It's because I put under caps in places they don't need to be. <laughs> I put them on a few of the keys that have the larger double size caps. So any stabilized key, uh, key does not actually need an undercap. For example, that one. That can go there. Uh, the enter key, of course. That can go here. The backspace. That can go here instead. that, 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 uh, over here, we need neither this one there, I can go here, nor this one here, this is where it would make sense for me to have my keycap puller. Maybe it made more sense to put the stabilized keys on first, actually, but... Uh, and then... We don't need this one. And we don't need this one. Or wait, do we? missing one. Hmm. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'm sure it will become apparent as I put the, the keycaps back on. So that's the next step, is to put the keycaps in the proper places. So this part should be pretty straightforward. It's just going to be maybe a little tricky for a few, but you know what? Let's actually put on the stabilized caps first uh, because that will sort of give us a, a framing to work from. That makes sense, right? Help us sort of frame in the rest of them. Um, oh, you might notice that uh, on uh, the ones with the stickers, uh, the stickers did not survive. <laughs> so, well, I shouldn't say that. Two of them sort of did. One of them mostly didn't. Um, so I ended up just taking them all off. Uh, as I said, I, I was a bit uh, reticent to, um, you know, deviate from stock, but uh, it just wasn't going to really work otherwise. So, um, and you know, I just realized this key with the caps lock here is one. I don't think we need a undercap for, so that probably goes here. Because if we look at the caps lock, yeah, I think that just goes straight on there. I like how it's a stepped caps lock. That's kind of fun, huh? Okay, what else do we have here? We have our enter key. Yeah, these came out really nice and clean. Backspace. <laughs> Gotta love it. Uh, the plus. Our space bar. Now, 
Uh, I think it should just be a simple matter of putting this here, kind of lining that up, and, you know, I probably should have done this. in the right spot. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, it's clipped under uh, those little clips, that, that wire is in its proper position. Sounding as clanky as ever. And so all that remains then is to just go through and put these where they belong. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Some of these will probably end up in the wrong places, inevitably. One or two over or something. Until we start to get things more filled in. Or maybe not. Maybe it'll all just come together really easy. shape. There's like a slight bit of wear to the surface on some of them, but it's honestly like quite minimal. Uh, Barely noticeable in most cases. something like that, I'm like, ah, oh, crap, that means I gotta <laughs> pay attention to that in post to make sure it's not too loud. But usually, usually what I can do, and you know, hopefully this <laughs> is borne out, you know, hopefully you guys don't didn't find that, say, that the keycap fall 
calling sound too loud, but um, usually what I can do is use a compressor uh, to ensure that uh, nothing is too loud. But even when you use a compressor and sort of bring the dynamics uh, down, it, it can still, like, even noises that are relatively quiet can still be kind of jarring simply because they happen like, in isolation, uh, you know, or are different from the other sounds going on in the video. Uh, sort of in, in the vicinity of that sound, and um, that's tricky. It's a tricky thing for me to, you know, catch and edit out. Um, but I do my best. You know, I listen through the whole video and do my best to uh, cut out the jarring sounds. But every once in a while, stuff does get through. I do apologize if there are things that, that uh, you know, that you find uh, um, slightly uh, startling or jarring in some of my videos. I really do try to minimize that stuff, but it can be tough, especially with these long videos. Sometimes it's easy to lose, uh, you know, lose uh, a couple of a couple of sounds that might potentially be jarring uh, in, in the video. Hopefully, that's not the case in this one. Hopefully also, uh, all of these were in fact dry on the underside. <laughs> I think they were. Uh, no, I'm not because we're in I think they were. Um, but yeah, I, Ideally, don't want to be getting water down in the pause. Gosh, which one is that? I think, I think it's that. Pretty sure. Yeah, I don't want to get water down into the no print screens on that side. Into the mechanisms. shipping up pretty good, I think. Shockingly. <laughs> Maybe I've put everything in the right place. More or less. Left 
out of the final four. Close that. That. Our oh, final five, I guess it was. <laughs> there. Uh -huh. And the last key. The letter A. Somehow seems poetic that the last keycap to go on is the first letter of the alphabet. And there it is, my friends. After, honestly, a fair bit of work, a fair bit of work, the Model M is reassembled and pretty much spotless, virtually pristine. Uh, if I'm really, really happy with just how clean and, uh, and, you know, intact, just pristine everything is here. But we're not quite done yet, friends. What remains is to ensure that it's actually going to function. Now, of course, uh, there's another component uh, it's key to the functioning of this board, and that is, of course, the cable. And you might recall earlier in the video, I mentioned it's a really good thing that the cable is removable because the cable that came with this board is this one right here. And it's got, uh, this is the stock cable. Um, from back in the day, we've got this SDL connector on this end. You see it's this big kind of chunky thing with these clips, these contacts here. And we've got this big, long, heavy vinyl coiled cable. Really awesome vintage piece. But there's a problem. Uh-oh. <laughs> spaghetti <laughs> This end has been severed. Someone decided to chop this cable from whatever it was attached to. I don't know why, um, but maybe maybe it was hardwired in somehow or couldn't be removed or they were just in a hurry. I don't know. In theory, this should just be a standard PS2 type connector. Uh, I believe that connector was introduced with the IBM uh, PS2, personal system 2, computer system, and uh, standardized with that system. And the PS2 connector would go on to be used in uh, pretty much every PC right through like 2010 or later, I want to say. Um, when I say PS2, I don't mean PlayStation 2. I mean personal system 2, which is a connector that you're probably familiar with, probably pretty much everyone. Um, and even some other boards being manufactured today probably are still being made with them for backwards compatibility. Uh, so that was a bit of an issue. So what I had to do was uh, go online. And I, I found another one. Uh, this is a uh, new old stock. Uh, original IBM cable. So that's to say uh, it is brand new <laughs> from the 1980s and uh, or early 1990s, I guess. Uh, shout out to uh, Yusuf in Tel Aviv. I bought this from him on eBay. Seems like he has a whole bunch of them, but it came sealed in its bag. Uh, and when I opened it up, it even smelled like an original product. You know, it just has that new electronic smell straight out of 1980. And I just thought that was fantastic. Um, so, genuine item never used from the period, which is fantastic. We have a little part number here, IBM part number tag. Um, and, uh, if we look here, we can see we've got the IBM branding right there 
on this end, this is the PS2 end. This connector, again, you're probably familiar with. If you've interacted with a computer in the last decade, chances are uh, one of these was on the motherboard. The more modern motherboards, the last couple of generations uh, from Intel and AMD, some of them do not have the PS2 connectors, but seriously, probably up to like 2015, I want to say like every motherboard had it. And then this is the end that goes into the keyboard. These cables are nice and heavy, which I love. They've just got a great weight to them. And uh, yeah, this one's spotless, just like our keyboard, which is fantastic. So what we can do is we can plug this in. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that I, I had tested this keyboard before I took it apart and it did function. Everything worked just great. This is how I did it with this new old stock cable. So this plugs in right here, like so, a very satisfying kerchunk. And there it is. Now there's one more thing that I gotta do. And that is, I need an adapter because even though this uses the PS2 style connector, which is present on, uh, uh, you know, many modern motherboards, uh, it is not present on my motherboard. Uh, the Asus uh, ROG Strix X570E. And so uh, what I need is an adapter to convert from PS2 to USB. And I need an active adapter because uh, this uh, old board being as you know vintage as it is, uh, the, the output from the board won't be recognized uh, by USB with a simple uh, passive adapter. So uh, I picked this one up from uh, Amazon. It's a mono price. Um, I think it was about $15 or something like that, maybe, maybe a little less. And uh, it'll take a mouse and a keyboard PS2 input. Um, so this should just, well, not should, it does. I know it does because I tested it earlier. <laughs> But this just goes like so. There it is. And then this plugs into any modern USB port. And voila, a functioning Model M on any modern system. So all that's left is to actually fire up my PC here, plug this in, and test it out to make sure that all the keys still work after the disassembly and reassembly adventure this board has been on. So let's do that. Okay, so I've got the PC on and the keyboard plugged in. You can see we've got the numlock on, illuminated over here. And uh, so we're clearly getting power. Uh, and uh, I have a keyboard tester open here will tell me if each key is working. Um, I don't have it on screen for you, but you're just gonna have to trust me. So I'm gonna go through, and press each key in sequence, and check that it's working. Looks good. Good, good, good. Okay, top row is looking good. Good. Excellent. I'm gonna have to turn the lock back on to get the proper number functions here on the next row. So 
far so good. Everything is illuminating as functional.
there you have it, my friends. <laughs> the entire process of inspecting, disassembling, cleaning, rebuilding, and testing this beautiful IBM Model M. What did you think? <laughs> what, are your, what are your thoughts on this piece of hardware? Is it all it's cracked up to be? Or do you think it's overhyped? Personally, for me, it's about this hardware's place in computing history. It's about the unique uh, feel and sound of this keyboard. And it's about nostalgia. I won't lie. Uh, this is, of course, the keyboard that I grew up with in my very early years. And so uh, I have some great memories associated with the, the particular feel, sound, and aesthetics of the IBM Model M. So for me, having this back on my, my desktop, typing on it again, honestly, when I first plugged this in and, and it all worked and I, I started typing, I just had a big stupid grin <laughs> like plastered on my face. It just makes me happy. So I'm really glad that I found this keyboard. I'm really glad that I managed to get a, a solid deal on it, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that it is in as good shape as it is. It is virtually flawless. And that's pretty remarkable when you consider its age. Every time I say that, I cringe a little inside because <laughs> technically it's younger than me by a little bit. So, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it really is uh, an immaculate piece of hardware uh, considering the years on it. When I was using it, I, I was struck by a, like how loud this thing is by modern standards. Uh, like it's louder than any other keyboard I have, even my like boards with the kale box white clicky switches. Um, well, maybe it's on par with the kale box whites, but you know, it's very loud, but this was the standard back in the day. No one thought twice about it. You just had a very loud keyboard on your desk. You can imagine an office full of these people typing away. It would be pretty, pretty loud you now. Um, but that's, I guess, how it was. And it, it occurred to me that maybe people didn't think about it too much because they would have been coming from typewriters. Like a decade earlier, typewriters would have been dominant or even less than a decade. Um, and so by comparison, perhaps this didn't seem all that bad. The typing feel also is much heavier than a modern keyboard user is going to be used to, especially if you're accustomed to rubber dome keyboards with a very kind of soft, mushy, light tactility. This is the complete opposite of that. It is loud and brash and chunky and uh, kind of amazing that way. Also kind of tiring <laughs> for my fingers. Uh, I've been using this now for a, a day or two. Uh, in fact, this video that you are watching right now, I edited all of it uh, on this keyboard. And um, in addition to doing some typing and programming and whatnot, and yeah, my, my fingers were getting tired after a little while of typing on this thing. And uh, I guess I just need to get my, my finger gains going. I've become soft and weak with all these lubed 35 gram linear switches these days. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. The contrast between this and modern keyboard hardware, but uh, also I think that's part of what makes this uh, so special these days. It is kind of a, a singular experience to, to type on uh, a classic, authentic IBM Model M. So my friends, thank you for coming along on this adventure with me. I'm really glad that it turned out as well as it did. There was no guarantee that it would, but it did, and I could not be happier. Uh, so, as always, I hope that you found this interesting and informative. I hope that you found it relaxing, and I look very forward to having you back here 
next time. Farewell for now, my friends. Oh, and did I mention that this video was selected, voted on, by some of our amazing supporters on Patreon and YouTube memberships? I think I did mention that way back at the beginning of the video, but it was so long ago that I figure maybe I should remind you. Yes, this video was our patrons pick slash members choice for June 2023. Supporters at the Fusro and higher tier get to vote on a video topic every month. And I'm really glad that they selected this one because I was really excited to do it. And all of our amazing supporters help me to make these kinds of videos, these nerdier, not really mainstream popular videos, but ones that I get really excited about and that hopefully you enjoy as well. So a big shout out to each and every one of our amazing supporters that you see here in these lists. There is one particular tier, however, the Fus Roda tier of supporter, who get their names read out in every single one of my videos. A very special spoken shout out. And that is what you are about to hear right now. Our Fus Roda tier supporters for this video are James C. Dragoon 88, Ragnar Ragnarsson, Angel Garcia, K. Time, Jake Luffney, Rango Steel, and Drummer Brit. What an incredible group of folks. I cannot thank them enough for their immense support. Once again, friends, if you are interested in checking out what fun perks are available to you through my Patreon or YouTube memberships, and perhaps getting your name added to this list of illustrious individuals, please check out the links down below in the video description. A huge thank you once again to this channel's amazing supporters.